Okay, our next speaker is Christopher Bedford. Uh, he serves as Editor-in-Chief of the Daily Caller News Foundation. He also serves on the boards of Young Americans for Freedom and the National Journalism Center. Uh, his top-notch writing has appeared in a number of publications, including the Wall Street Journal, uh, the New York Post, uh, The Federalist, and The American Mind. He is a frequent guest on the Fox News Channel, Fox Business Network, and the Catholic News Service. And he's also the author of a book, and I have to confess I really do like the title, uh, The Art of the Donald, Lessons from America's Philosopher-in-Chief. Um, lastly, I would be remiss if I did not mention that in October last year, uh, he married a Hillsdale College alumna, the former Catherine Freights. Uh, so congratulations. Um, he'll, be, uh, he'll be speaking today on the topic, Trump in the Media. Would you please welcome Christopher Bedford? Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Arn, uh, Doug Jeffrey, Matt Bell, Samantha Strayer, for bringing me out here to this fantastic gathering. It's not too common in California these days. <laughs> I was uh, lucky enough to marry a Hillsdale graduate, uh, Katie. She was a cheerleader at Hillsdale. She was a Kappa Kappa Gamma at Hillsdale. Um, she, she studies video games for a living now, which is... <laughs> which she, hide, she hid when I first met her, and she's absolutely into it. But she also, when she was at Hillsdale, she studied finance, and somehow, despite that being her focus, came out of college with more understanding of Austrian economics and Plato and Aristotle than people who went to my college who majored in those things. And it's not because she had any specific interests, it's because the education was so darn good. And also I have Hillsdale to thank uh, for give, building the foundation, making it a little bit easier for me to bring her across to Tiber, back to Rome, in the Catholic faith. <laughs> and, but she's not unique from a lot of the people I've met in Washington, D.C. who went to Hillsdale. I noticed as soon as I got, I've lived in D.C. for 15 years, in the swamp, it feels like a hot tub now. And the people I've met over the years from Hillsdale have always impressed me, absolutely blown me away. Uh, Well-read, well-rounded, deep thinkers, seriously civic-minded, very interested. Um, and Hillsdale, of course, receives no federal funding, and I think I've made it a rule, still discussing this with the wife, that if my kids want any Chris Bedford funding, they'll go to Hillsdale or something like it. <laughs> but. They, are, they stand out so much in Washington, D.C., because D.C. is a city of deeply, deeply stupid people with... <laughs> There's no grasp of history uh, at all. People can't remember what it was like before President Donald Trump. They can't remember what it was like before President Barack Obama. They can't remember what it was like before net neutrality regulations. They think it's the apocalypse and they're the worst kind of stupid because they're very arrogant and extremely smug. And uh, I, I would like to, to preface this that the gentlemen I sat with today from the uh, Orange County Register are, are not who I'm talking about. But every other member of the media <laughs> is who I am talking about. <laughs> and my reporters complain to me, we have a lot of young folks. I'm one of the old people in the office. It's, it's, we pay very little and work them very hard. And, my reporters complain about all of their colleagues on the Hill, who they cover news with, and people they meet at the Capitol in the White House, how, uh, how shallow and self-absorbed and stupid they are. And I unfortunately can't tell them that it gets any better. The higher you rise in media, those people come right with you. <laughs> you look around, and it's annoying to see. I mean, you don't want to wish ill on anyone. You want everyone to succeed. But it's amazing how many terrible people succeed in Washington, DC, just com continuously failing upward. So, speaking of the media getting everything wrong, uh, leading up to the campaign for president, I had heard, I think as anyone who was reading the news, 
that President Donald Trump was a cold fish, a uh, kind of guy who could never do retail politics. He wasn't a handshaker. He was an ivory tower, not ivory tower, but glass tower Manhattan businessman. He had nothing in common with the workers of America, with the people you'd have to meet in the campaign trail. This wasn't his style. He was a germaphobe, all these different things. I'd also heard that uh, Rubio was a nice guy and that Jeb Bush was unbeatable. <laughs> and I started to notice that something was amiss on the campaign trail actually meeting with these folks. The first time I noticed something was very interesting about President Donald Trump, and I was slower than a lot of, a lot of maybe people in this room, was in Iowa when we went out about an hour and a half. Everything in Iowa is at least an hour and a half from anything else in Iowa. <laughs> and we went out to a gymnasium to hear the, president's, or the future president speak. And I noticed that the entire crowd, the, the audience, most of the men had jeans and boots, a Vietnam War shirt, leather jacket, and a Vietnam War hat. This was very much a uh, crowd that I was told would have no interest in a guy who walks in there and a custom Brioni suit with a red trucker hat on. <laughs> and I noticed that in a lot of the campaign st trail stops, most of, the, most of the presidential candidates, they would give the exact same speech, but they would change what they were wearing. So they would roll up their sleeves and take off their cufflinks in a working class area. They'd put on their suit in a middle class area and they'd sw oddly swap it out for a vest in a wealthy area. Uh, President Trump didn't do any of that. He never dressed up once. And this group of folks who would go in there with their family, their wives, their children, they didn't mind at all. He seemed to connect with them. And another myth, he does run out of energy. He actually sat down for this speech. I'd never seen it, but the campaign trail was exhausting. And I was talking to some of the makeup girls and they're an interesting folks to talk to because they walk around, go around in the campaign trail and they see all the people who are on TV, the talking heads, the politicians, and they see them in a closed quarter where no one else can see them. No cameras are on. There's no fans there. It's just them. So you kind of get an idea, just like the same way you get an idea of somebody, how they treat the bartender or the waiter. And they told me that the, the meanest person on the campaign trail, and I haven't personally experienced this, was Marco Rubio. He's Mr. Nice Guy, right? He's always been kind to me. And that the nicest person was Donald Trump. And that surprised me. Tucker took us out when we were on the campaign trail to a steakhouse in New Hampshire. And we got there, and I was pretty excited about that because he was paying. <laughs> and we're talking to the maitre d' saying, any candidates come into the steakhouse? And he said, no way. New Hampshire is right now in a mess. There's a massive drug problem. There's a problem with poverty. There's a problem with lack of education. And anyone who's a candidate for a president here doesn't go to the nicest steakhouse in Manchester. They go to the diners, they go to the burger stands. They, watching candidates eat is like still one of the grossest parts of the entire election. <laughs> and then I saw Secret Service coming in and I thought, wow, we got Hillary Clinton. She can't get away from it. She's such an elitist. We're gonna have a story out of this. And then the entire Trump family walked in and there's no story there. Donald Trump eats steak, everyone knows this. Because he, he's himself, he's not pretending to be out there. And he walked right up to us because he recognized Tucker. And he, he just lit up the table. He started grabbing people by the shoulders, shaking hands, taking pictures with children. He was it, 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 just after the debate. And Trump, I, I really doubt that he was too concerned about Rubio's health, but he seemed to be that day. He's like, I'm, I'm looking at him. He's sweating, he's sweating. Are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> and he... And then he grabbed one of our reporters by the shoulder and he goes, this guy works. He works nights, he works weekends, he never stops, he never stops. And we all knew that this guy was unreachable after Jeopardy. It was, we used to make fun of him. There was no shot. But Trump made him feel like the biggest guy in the room, even though everyone knew he was fibbing. He made everyone, he, he lit up the room. And the next morning we went to a diner and this was the day of the New Hampshire primary. I got in there early. Uh, a little hungover, as reporters do. And when I walked in, Jeb Bush was sitting alone at the counter looking like a sad American painting. <laughs> Just not having a good day, down on his luck. He gave a quick interview to Steve Ducey and Tucker for Fox and Friends, and then he left. And then Chris Christie came in. He came in through the back door, and he's supposed to be you know, the man's man, the brawler. He'll fight you on the boardwalk if you make fun of him. And he came in the back door, 
gave a quick interview, and was gone. And then Secret Service came in, and President Trump came in with his family, or then businessman Trump. Came in with Corey Lewandowski sitting there in the corner on his cell phone, his wife, the whole entourage. And by the time he sat down, he knew everyone in the kitchen staff's names. He yells in the middle of the camera. He goes, who are you voting for, Susie? And she yells back, America. <laughs> and he says, he turns to the camera and goes, of course I knew she was going to say that, otherwise I wouldn't have asked her. <laughs> and I got the whole crowd going. And then an hour later, I still had to go through Secret Service to use the restroom because he hung out. He got a big, massive stack of pancakes, gigantic, and sat there just eating and talking with people like no other candidate had done. And I thought, the press obviously does not understand this man. They, and they deeply hate him, completely hate him. And the press likes to pretend, we like to pretend that we liked the last president when they're gone. Nowadays, you remember the Reagan funeral. I mean, it was just lauding. It was, everyone, taught, everyone was Reagan's best friend. He was the last president who united us. Of course, if you go to 70 miles north of here to the Reagan Ranch or the Reagan Center in Santa Barbara, they have a great clip on the wall that's just playing over and over again the things that the media said about Ronald Reagan when he was president. That he was senile, that he was stupid, that he was evil, that he was betraying America's interests, that he was betraying America's principles. They like to defend that now. But reporters, they don't remember yesterday. It's unbelievable. They think that right now is the worst time in American history. I'd like to remind them of 1968 or maybe the 1860s, something we've been discussing here. I think the country's been a little bit more divided. They don't understand President Trump. They don't understand a lot of what's going on here in Washington, D.C. But the funny part is Trump actually deeply understands them. He can get right to them. He can turn them on. He can turn them off. He can pour water on their circuits. And here's a story. And it gets a little obscene because the president gets a little obscene sometimes. But it was the week of McConnell's failure to repeal Obamacare. Uh, Mitch, Mitch McConnell had promised a vote by June 30th before the Independence Day break. It had been years and years in the coming, many campaign trail speeches on it. And the press was in Washington practically salivating. They were so excited for him to fail. They, they were asking questions like, oh, why won't he just ask the Democratic Party to help him? Is that going to be so hard? And everyone in every, anywhere knew full well that the Democratic Party was not interested in helping the GOP repeal Obamacare. There was not going to be a compromise on this issue. The guys, authors of Political Playbook, which is uh, morning reading in Axios in Washington, D.C., were absolutely electric for this failure, but the morning of the failure to repeal Obamacare, only three people definitely knew that the Republicans didn't have the votes, and that was John Cornyn, the whip, Mitch McConnell, President Donald Trump, probably Vice President Mike Pence. Everyone was waiting for it. And at 9.30 in the morning, we get a tweet, and this was back when, just at the beginning of him doing this. Fake news CNN is looking at big management changes now that they got caught falsely pushing their phony Russian stories Ratings way down. And then 17 minutes later, so they caught fake news, CNN, cold. But what about NBC, CBS, and ABC? What about the failing New York Times and Washington Post? They are all fake news. And nine hours, he went silent. The press went absolutely wild. How dare he attack the press? And now they're a little bit more used to it. So he has to come up with new tricks. But it's not too hard to trick them. It's like coming up with new games for the cat. Here's, here's a ball of tinfoil. I was at the Tune In that day, which is a great watering hole if you're ever in Washington, D.C., covered in taxidermy, $3 beers. And the news switched for about five minutes to cover Mitch McConnell's press conference saying that they did not have the votes to repeal Obamacare. And then they switched right back to the president making fun of CNN. How Dare he? I mean, America's healthcare system is important, but nothing in the mind of a DC journalist is more important than the DC journalist. They are the heroes, the well sung heroes. And two days later, though, they had another chance. All right, they get their, their eye back on the ball. Wait a second, we're supposed to be here to pound on the GOP. Friday, as they leave for the, for the break, that'll be the time to change the news subject. 
So President Trump had to do something a little bit more than just make fun of CBS. And he did, you might remember this one. I heard poorly rated Morning Joe speaks badly of me, don't watch anymore. Then how come low IQ crazy Mika along with Psycho Joe came and then the dot, 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 and everyone in DC is just waiting, <laughs> waiting for what's coming next. <laughs> it's the greatest feeling. To Mar-a-Lago, three nights in a row around New Year's Eve and insisted on joining me. She was bleeding badly from a facelift. I said no. <laughs> that got their attention. <laughs> you would be forgiven for thinking that Trump had just sacrificed a baby on the altar of Cthulhu instead of insulting one of the most powerful, famous women in the world with access to the corridors of power in a very successful television show for cosmetic surgery. They, Joe and Mika delayed their vacation. I know that because the MSNBC Chiron had a countdown that said Joe and Mika cancel vacation to address President's comments in the morning. She, she released an entire column talking about how her mother had suggested a quote, chin tweak. <laughs> My mom says some pretty mean things to me after I get off of television too. She thinks I need Botox. <laughs> um, I'm not getting it yet. Still holding out. But the Donald Trump show was on the air for 24 hours a day. He commanded what the press was covering, how they were covering it. He dominated the conversation. Now granted, it wasn't a great conversation for the president. Uh, he was called uncouth, he was called, I mean, not since Jefferson versus Adams have we seen such amazing insults hurled back and forth at each other. But they were not talking about the failure of the Republican Party. They were talking about President Donald Trump. So I was having a drink that Friday evening in one of the Senate offices for the uh, gentleman who was in charge of communication on the Obamacare front, and he said, we weren't getting anything from Senate leadership. We had no idea about the lack of the votes. But the press didn't come, they didn't even care. It was one of two things, either Donald Trump's a PR genius or divine intervention. And you can tell me which one you'd side. And you know, we can figure that out later, over, over dinner maybe. So the press has tried to grow wise to this. They, they actually ask occasionally for a moment when we're talking about some scandal or some trip, they'll say, well, what aren't we talking about right now? Because typically when the president does something that seems out of the blue, it's to change the conversation. But they, they, they don't have the attention. They don't have the focus to stay on it. They can't help themselves. He does things like the classic tricks of the State of the Union, where you say something like, we've freed women from sexual slavery on the border, because you know that if the Democrats refuse to stand up for that thing, then they look really silly. There was a couple of times during the speech when congresswomen were whacking Ocasio-Cortez and saying, stand up. He said we're freeing people from sexual slavery. This is okay. We can be proud of this. <laughs> did, did you notice that the, the loudest applause line that the women in white gave themselves during the State of the Union was for themselves? <laughs> it was pretty amazing. So he'll trick them. He'll, he'll call MS-13 animals. And then what does the press do? The press spends the next 48 hours defending MS-13. <laughs> It's unbelievable how quickly he tricks them, but it's because, because the press is thoroughly, thoroughly corrupt, except for the Orange County Register. <laughs> uh, Lara Logan, a great war correspondent, said in a podcast last week, she, honestly, she must be looking to get fired, that 85% of journalists are registered Democrats. All the coverage on Trump all the time is negative, and she called that distortion. And she's right, but the press aren't even normal Democrats. Uh, if you walk into the average newsroom in New York or Washington, D.C., it might be a perfect representation of America. 30% black, 20%, 30% Hispanic, a perfect racial mix. But if you say who here goes to church on Sunday, you're not going to get a lot of responses. If you say who here voted for President Donald Trump, or forget about him, President Romney, or, or Senator Romney, who voted for President Bush. Maybe a few hands, a smattering of hands, but largely, despite looking different, despite, you know, 50% gay, all the different things that they hit, that was a cheap one. <laughs> they don't have any cultural connection to most Americans. 
If you remember that very brief blip of time when the press was looking at themselves and saying, what did we do wrong after Trump was elected? Even the Democrats were doing it, saying, well, we, we obviously missed a huge voter block. We obviously missed a train. They, they later switched it to Russia, and it's Russia's fault and the Ku Klux Klan. Um, for a minute, they even planned tours of America. I looked at, it was either BuzzFeed or the Huffington Post did a Cross America tour so they could understand what people outside of New York thought. But the cities they went to were like Columbus, Ohio, Austin, Texas. No, these are great cities. I was just in Columbus, and I love Austin. But they're not the heartland. You don't get a great idea of what the average Ohio voter or Texan voter feels like from going to a hipster bar in a college town. But they didn't even know that. They were very proud of themselves. So the press has a role to play, an important role. They'll remind you of that all the time. They're, they're, at, they're positively knights uh, of a free republic. But more and more, the American media is not simply not asking the questions, which is what we're supposed to do. They're deciding what questions can be asked. They are making themselves arbiters of what is polite conversation, what is an acceptable line of questioning, what is deemed racist, what is deemed irresponsible, what is deemed an assault on the Constitution. Remember, this all began pretty early when President-elect Trump sneaked away to a steakhouse in New York City. They called that an assault on the First Amendment because they couldn't cover him. Look at what they did to the Covington kids, those high schoolers. Now, so we have elite journalists in New York City, people with media platforms making a million dollars a year, access to power, great education, talking about Catholic school kids from a town in Kentucky who they say are privileged. <laughs> and they're sneering, they said. Look what they did with this Smollett case in Chicago. You know, the idea that at 2 a.m. on one of the coldest nights in Chicago, people wearing red MAGA hats are wandering around with a noose and bleach saying, this is MAGA country, will they kick people who they recognize from a show called Empire, is so unbelievable. <laughs> it, it doesn't pass the sniff test. And it's funny, Smollett wanted to be a scriptwriter, and I think he should find a new career, because that's a terrible plot line. <laughs> but if you looked... Even during the election, there was an article that got repeated and repeated and repeated that in Northern Virginia, which is a very wealthy, government-subsidized area of Virginia, a lot of traffic, that the Ku Klux Klan was handing out joints to deter the black vote. Now that's, that's not happening. <laughs> that's deeply stupid. If, if somebody wants weed, they'll get their own weed, and no one's going to walk up to a voting booth and say, oh, the Klan just gave me a joint, I guess I'll go home. <laughs> These kind of stories that are completely unbelievable, the idea that a billion dollar election was swayed by one million dollars in spending or less by Russia. They must have the best campaign consultants in the entire planet. The over and over again, these completely farcical, unbelievable narratives are pushed, and the reason why they're believed are because people in the press have no outside view. They've never been challenged in college. They haven't, they haven't been challenged by their peers. They're surrounded by people who think very much like them. And they haven't even considered that they could be wrong or that if they repeat something to themselves that maybe it's, it's completely false. And they're all convinced of the absolute wickedness of our president. And he's able to twist them, like I said. Have you seen how him telling NATO to give more money to contribute to NATO's defense is playing into the hands of Putin? That was an interesting one. <laughs> Out Magazine, which is a, uh, a gay magazine, recently called his move to decriminalize homosexuality around the world American cultural imperialism. <laughs> that was very interesting. <laughs> and it's hard to keep track of all these different things. How do they unite? Because they're not even traditionally liberal talking points. They've been changing dramatically with time. It's mostly just hashtag resist, opposition to Trump. But the one thing that connects all of these things is that they guard the elite, they guard the vested interests of the United States. They, the press is more than ever exposed itself as a Praetorian guard for Silicon Valley. They'll attack every now and then 
for, for the democratic establishment, for the liberal colleges. These are the things that cannot ever be touched. And anyone, especially President Trump, who tries to, will be attacked by them. They're here to protect the wealthy from, from the people. And it's an unbelievable place to find a free press in, but it connects them and basically everything that they do. We at the News Foundation are trying to counter that. We have a nonprofit news organization where we train journalists over two years in the classics, not nearly as deeply as a Hillsdale education. Some of our best reporters are from Hillsdale. But we read basic economics, read about the founding of the country, and also read about how, for example, calling your sources, confirming a story before it goes live, how one anonymous source does not make a story, how the dishonesty of the press, how if you've got three people who are former officials and one person who's a current official, the New York Times will mask that as according to a number of current and former officials. That means they've got one current official and there's other people, they may be former, they have no idea what's going on in that room anymore. We teach our reporters that that's bad. And then we try to get them jobs at liberal outlets because the center right is phenomenally good at opinion. They've dominated talk radio, dominated the magazines uh, as when they existed. They're starting, unfortunately, to leave us. Dominated the blogosphere, dominated cable. But they haven't dominated the news. The New York Times, Washington Post still have thousands of reporters who are working all the time. Did you see that the Washington Post launched an investigative unit when President Trump was elected? They'd gotten rid of it under President Obama. How unbelievable is that? Now they need to investigate Russia, Russia, Russia all the time. So we've sent reporters to CBS, CNN, Newsweek, The Hill, and some of them get co-opted, but I still have their phone numbers, so I call them, and I tell them I think so. The civil society that we have is worth defending. The press is an institution worth defending, but it needs to be held to account. The arguments that you used to have maybe around the Thanksgiving table about whether the press is, is liberal, that people don't even have that argument anymore because it's even your family members that might disagree with you, have disagreed with you, now agree with you. They just, just have to decide whether or not they think it's good that the press is part of the resistance. But the First Amendment is one of the greatest gifts that we have, one of the greatest rights that we have, and it, all it takes is responsible, responsible journalism, well-trained to try and fix it. It's sad to see what's happening to the press with the bankruptcies, people going out of business, but I, at the same time, I've never seen a group of people who deserve it more than they do. <laughs> it's hard, because it's my living, <clears throat> but it's totally deserved. It's, it's practically a suicide at some points. So we're working to take it back uh, with some of the Hillsdale graduated folks that we've hired over the years, including my wife who worked for me for a time, Live the American dream, go to DC, marry your boss. <clears throat> <laughs> it was tough going to work with her every day. <laughs> um, we're, we're working to take that back and to provide an example for young folks who are dedicated to, we'll buy their beer because they won't be able to afford it. Everyone's parents are always upset with them when they become a journalist, but it is the most fun and it is an important job. And hopefully when all this is over, We'll still have a free press, I think we will, and one that can stand strong with our republic for the next 250 years. Thank you. I can't threaten your dessert, like Dr. Arn did, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. <coughs> Right behind you, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Clear high thinking is always indispensable. Uh, I'd like to ask you a fundamental question. Namely, what is essentially the problem of the press? And by way of suggesting an answer, Thomas Jefferson once was written to by a fellow who wanted to start a newspaper, and Jefferson was in the White House at the time. And he was asked, what are the ingredients of a good newspaper, which could be said about the media as a whole. And in that reply, in which he said many things, he said this is particularly important, uh, true facts and sound principles. 
And so much of conservative thought is, is focused on the true facts, which is understandable because so many of them are, are either not reported or suppressed. Um, but those sound principles, as you indicated in your last few remarks, is, are indispensable. In other words, the, the media need to be factual, they need to be accurate, they need to be fair, but they also need to be committed to the American Republic and the principles that underlay the, fa the whole foundations of the system. Because without that, they're uh, without any kind of guidance. What is your opinion on that? Uh, thank you. Uh, Charles Murray talked about special classes of people in America in his very interesting book, Coming Apart. And the press was one a specific example he gave of not people who are not super well educated, extremely wealthy or extremely powerful, who hang out with people who are all the time. And it's, that's a rare thing in most societies to have a lower middle class to middle class group of people who have access to the lunch tables, the dinner tables, the bar rooms and salons of the ruling elite of the country. Uh, the press has that for sure. It causes a lot of envy. Reporters love free lunches and open bars. The, because of that, I think, a lot of our press have started to consider themselves in a similar fashion to what our elite do, which is as global citizens, as people who don't, the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance would be tacky. Uh, to say a prayer before dinner would be imperialism. To think of this country as one given to us, fought for uh, by American patriots, to them it's more of a thing about the slave owners in the past, about the darkness of American history, the Howard Zinn guide to history, and there's not a strong allegiance amongst lots of the, a large part of the press to the actual well-being of the United States. I mean, if you've read in the last few, just in the last week, the press has had a sob story about the false asylum seekers who are no longer seeking asylum because President Trump has seemed too hard for them. Now, they're fighting very, very hard for the citizens of Honduras and Guatemala, much harder than they are for the average worker in America and Iowa, people who they, you'd think they would have more to do with. I don't know if you caught the sob stories of government workers who didn't get a paycheck for three weeks, <laughs> but those networks won't even let angel moms on. They have no sympathy at all for the Americans who've lost children, brothers, sisters, parents, to crimes committed by illegal immigrants. They consider themselves citizens of the world and America as a bad actor who they're here to police. And without that, without understanding the foundations of a free society, how we got here, they're just like spoiled children in the playhouse, breaking things, criticizing things, and attacking things. And that's one of the reasons why after, in our second, we call them semesters, but really they're just pizza dinners with speakers and beer. I gotta incentivize our guys to come in. Uh, after we do the basics of reporting, we focus on the foundations of a free society at the Daily Caller News Foundation so we can push how we got here, what made this country free, what made this country great. Men like Churchill, who in, it, it saved Western civilization, and why Western civilization is actually something worth saving, which a lot of folks don't believe. It's amazing. Also, but by and large, a lot of them are just stupid and lazy. We are the laziest class of people. It's unbelievable. Not me, of course, <laughs> or the OC register. Yes, sir. I find at least 90% of the discussion of this descriptive and very little prescriptive. So I would like to hear perhaps some of your prescriptions on how to cure it. Now, with all the wealth that we have as Republicans, you look at Forbes 400 list, why haven't they taken over, bought out CNN, why haven't they endowed a uh, decent journalism school, not Columbia where I went, but that's impossible, and taken an aggressive approach, a direct attack as a prescription, rather than always complaining about how they are. There's nothing to cure it within the description. You have to have a direct attack. Fortunately, you're in a, in a room that breaks that mold. The folks who are here supporting the work that Hillsdale does, 
a lot of the GOP donors class has, has, well, one, the GOP donor class is largely disconnected from the GOP base. And that's been a problem for a while. That's why you had a donor class that seriously thought that Jeb Bush was going to win the presidential nomination. And we're so surprised to see that change. And that realignment is going on currently. It sounds painful. It's not easy to have a spine that's like this, try to get split back to that. <clears throat> but by and large, conservatives have neglected the fight on college campuses and have ceded the ground to liberals. Uh, the gentleman I was sitting next to at lunch today was talking about endowing a chair at one of his colleges that he supports for free enterprise and was told the free enterprise was a pejorative. Now, he decided to stop giving money to that college, as I understand. However, most people don't. Bill Buckley wrote about this right after he got out of Yale and got a man at Yale. He said, the people who fund our universities have the power to stop this. A lot of them are conservative. A lot of them are successful in business. A lot of them, a lot of people who are conservative generally are successful in business, but they don't. They don't hold the universities to account like they should. And groups like Hillsdale and organizations like the Daily Caller News Foundation that, and there are a couple other colleges out there as well. Don't worry, I won't advertise them, Dr. Arn who are producing, <laughs> who, are, who are teaching the classics, who are pushing back against this, and who are creating a group that can hopefully change the trajectory. And that's what we're doing at the News Foundation. There's very few other places that are doing original news reporting on the center right. But as a Catholic conservative, I think we're all doomed, and that's okay. So I'm not necessarily the optimist to go, to go with on this. But I, am see I have seen some good moves on the right the difficulty with places like CNN is the culture is so strong there. And if, you, if your colleagues think you're a bigot, or they think that you're, quote, on the wrong side of the history, which is one of the creepiest accusations you can launch at somebody. One, it says that you're on the right side of history, and it immediately calls in mind Nazism, or, or Ku Klux Klanism, or some other ism. Uh, if your colleagues are doing that, it makes a lot of good people be quiet for their jobs, and even conservative outlets like Fox News, uh, they still recruit from a talent pool in New York City and Washington, D.C. So they still, even then, with more conservative leaning organizations, you have to battle that. It's a hard fought battle, there's no easy solutions, but a group like this sitting here focusing on education, and what's amazing is a group like this, a lot of the people here don't even actually, haven't even sent children through Hillsdale, they just know it's doing an important job. That's one of the most positive things I've ever seen for, I think, changing the youth and changing the future. Hi, thanks for your pithy comments. Um, I'm from Orange County. Unfortunately, we don't even have a Republican uh, congressman anymore, which is hard to believe. But I'm curious, uh, three news stories that hit la within the last week or two what you and your peers actually really say about, number one, the standing ovation applause in the New York uh, legislature when post-term abortion was approved, and number two, the ridiculous idea of building a train from the East Coast to Europe, and then most importantly, giving people a job, a high-paying job for people that are unable, but more importantly, unwilling to work. And if that, I'm, I'm just blown away that, that, no, that those are even, they, they even made the news. That that, and what, what, does your, what does your peer group say when things like that pop up in the news? Some of my friends have just been thoroughly broken by this whole thing. I had a friend who was a reporter for CNN, who just Trump scrambled his brain. And now he travels the world in a van he outfitted with his wife, camping and posting on Instagram. <laughs> he was smart. A lot of the other people whose brains were fried by President Trump didn't leave. And his brain wasn't fried. He just decided he was done with it. Um, this Virginia stuff has been very interesting. Now we have somebody who, a doctor, a pediatrician, who said that children should be made comfortable and allowed to die on a table after they're born, after discussion with the family, and he's taken down for wearing blackface in college. That's a pretty twisted line of what we deem 
an offense worthy of impeachment and what we deem just politics as normal. Uh, then the entire group, it looks like, is going down either for accusations of sexual assault or blackface. And what's interesting is it's, I've never seen karma hit a group so quickly as the Democrats, Democrats of Virginia when uh, hashtag me too became a thing and there was no longer a jury or a trial when they tried to destroy Judge Kavanaugh based on accusations of sexual assault. Thank goodness Me Too didn't exist during To Kill a Mockingbird. The, and they also accused Ralph Northam of being, or not Ralph Northam, they accused the Republican governor, gubernatorial candidate of being a racist and now it comes out that they've got awkward pictures in their past. And the press largely has ignored the biggest scandal of all of this, which is letting children die on the table. I mean, an actively illegal thing and immoral. Do you know, in Washington, D.C., during the government shutdown, because D.C. funds a lot of the city services in Washington, you couldn't get a marriage license, but you could get a divorce. That was deemed essential. I guess some folks might agree with that at certain times in their relationships, but I thought that was a sad comment on where we were. And the, Green New, the Green New Deal, though, is something that gets me really excited. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to spring, and I'm looking forward to the Democratic primaries. Kamala Harris and Cory Booker endorsing it, and uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez's office having to withdraw her frequently asked questions and say that the plan was accidentally released after they claimed it was, it was doctored. Well, Congresswoman, you already had two presidential candidates at least endorse it, and it turns out it was a mistake. Uh, we found a phenomenon with Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, and I assume the press has found this as well, outside of just my office, that she, in clicks, she increases the clicks on an article by about threefold. People are interested in her. She's photogenic, she says zany things. She is basically leading the Democratic Party in certain levels, and if you're a Republican, that should probably make you happy because I don't think she's leading them in a way that's very well thought out. She's a classic example of, of what colleges outside of Hillsdale produce in people. It's like she's never been cross-examined. She's never had to rethink any of her ideas. She's never been seriously challenged on this. She compared global warming to World War II and said we'd all be dead in 12 years. She will not be held accountable for that, by the way. Will not. In 12 years' time, no one will hold her accountable for that. And I think that uh, Winston Churchill would disagree with her on the severity of the issue of uh, cow flatulence versus Hitler's Germany. <laughs> the press has been careful with her, though. Uh, it's easy. She, she'll attack. She'll lash out. She'll say you're sexist for attacking her. But she's largely doing herself a discredit while becoming very popular. And I look forward to covering her. And I think most of my colleagues look forward to covering her over the years to come. Should be interesting. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. And on that uh, AOC question, a quick thought before my question. So I, I liken her to that last scene in Thelma and Louise driving <laughs> off the cliff. I hope it comes true because I do think they're following her as they head for the cliff. Uh, but my question is really more about a missing ingredient perhaps in your talk, and maybe you said it and I missed it, but there seems to be an enormous assumption by the media in Washington and New York of, about the stupidity of the American public that we accept this. And I, and I call back to my great awakening as an army vet, um, Benghazi. The fact that this, the people killed on that roof that night were number two and three mortar shells launched onto the roof, and yet we watched the president and the secretary of state try to just brush it off as an unorganized guy, people maybe going to the movies trying to break in and carry out an exercise. And there's thousands of vets that know that that attack took at least five people with radio communications and spotters to pull off and pre-practice positioning. And yet, the country's filled with people that understand what we were told by their two high leaders was an absolutely lie. And the press went along with it. Never did anybody question, how could that possibly be true? We have the facts in front of us. And yet, we were supposed to, as a nation, accept this absurd uh, explanation from the president 
and the media, not one person in the media ever tried to call him on it. The audience is actually far more uh, trained and critical than the media seem to be. The, that was one of the specific examples. I, I, I'm Irish, so I hold grudges forever. <laughs> and I haven't read The Economist once since their initial Benghazi coverage. And I know that everyone seems to like them because they've got a British accent, and that's, that's nice. We don't have a ruling class accent of our own, so we like that accent. The, they said that there was a number of former special operations forces who were just hanging out in Benghazi, this, this nice town, you know, it's a nice place to visit, who were killed by uh, an Al-Qaeda affiliate. And that, oh, oh, and an ambassador was there. There's nothing to see here. Why ever would former special operations forces be hanging out outside of Libya, outside of, outside of the capital in Benghazi in a place where they could be attacked by mortars, where they could be raided, where roads could be blocked off. They, they didn't even seem to, to simply ask that. They take the government's line over and over again. The FBI said they didn't do it, so they didn't do it. There's no more questions here. It's amazing. We had a story the other day where the inspector general was upset that Hillary Clinton's server had likely been hacked at some point by a foreign government. The FBI refused to investigate. We reported that. The FBI released a statement that said, we didn't find anything in an investigation. And the press took that as an answer and said that we were wrong. It was a double answer. It was a non-answer. The whole story was that you didn't investigate Federal Bureau of Investigations. We know you didn't find anything in that investigation. But the press went along because they're deeply stupid. But a lot of Washington, D.C. screwed up the Benghazi story, in my opinion. I was discussing this with some of our editors who covered it for Business Insider and, and the Marine Corps Times who are with us now. Even the, G the GOP messed up. They made it so much about this video and this lie that the president told and the secretary of state told that our consulate was attacked and our ambassador was killed because somebody from Egypt living in America had made fun of Mohammed. <laughs> it's just another one of those very difficult to believe stories. But President Obama was busy running guns to unvetted rebels in Syria. That's what they were doing out there. That's what the ambassador was there for. That's what he was meeting with the Turks for. Fox News actually tracked them down to the, the, the freighter, where they said they were bringing them to gather them together to destroy them. They were giving weapons that could take down a passenger airliner to unvetted terrorist affiliates to fight Assad. That's the real insanity of Benghazi, and no one was able to get to the bottom of it. They were called conspiracy theorists by the Praetorian Guard and the press. The Democrats said it was racist to question President Barack Obama. And the Republicans got hung up on the easy fish of, well, the president clearly lied about this video. We know it wasn't the video. Everyone missed the real story. And also a lot of people missed how our NATO ally, and I tried to get to this, but I couldn't get, I couldn't get more than one source. And unlike the New York Times, I wasn't gonna claim it was more than one source that the Turkish ambassador had left the consulate at a time when locals had reported that the Al-Qaeda affiliate had already set up roadblocks that were marked with Al-Qaeda's signage flag, which means the Turks drove through, leaving the American consulate, an Al-Qaeda-affiliated blockade, and didn't call back. There's not a single record that they came and they warned the Americans that they were surrounded by Al-Qaeda. Sounds like we were betrayed by a NATO ally, but I guess if President Trump ever tried to get to the bottom of that, he'd be helping Putin. <laughs> and they do think the American people are stupid. It is unbelievable. And worse than that, they think that they're very smart. They're very self-satisfied. Can you tell I don't like reporters? <laughs> Except for the OC register? <laughs> Chris, one of my favorite lines in all-time favorite lines in, is in movies is Colonel Jessup saying, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> I wonder what those of us in this room, those of us who are conservative and still read or listen to the media, what we can do to hold George Will and Bill Crystal and people like them accountable. Uh, my wife and I have not watched national television for over a year. I turned it on when I came to this conference 
and I could only stand it for five minutes. Even, even Fox has, has moved left. And I look at things like One America News and other outlets and say, what, what do we got to do to convince the wills and crystals of this world to, to handle the truth? I don't think you will. I think Bill Crystal is a thoroughly broken man. He's somebody who had so much promise and everyone assumed was going to be good and interesting. He put together a magazine that was good and interesting for a period of time. And then he took to Twitter. And it's rotten. It's rotted his brain. He, he's ended... He was Tucker Carlson, one of my good friends and my boss's first bosses in Washington, D.C. Tucker looked up to him. Uh, cared what he thought, disagreed with him on a lot of different things, but considered him a friend. And Bill Crystal called him an anti-Semite in a tweet. He didn't even call him, didn't even text him, didn't say, hey, buddy, let's talk. I think your show is going down the wrong path. He's now living in some kind of strange fantasy land. Remember when he recruited a Republican whose name I can't even remember to run against President Trump as a third-party candidate? And then he spent that weekend going to a carnival with his grandchildren, which I know because he tweeted it. That's not how you run an opposition campaign to win president of the United States. It takes a lot of work. But he's more interested, and a lot of his friends are very interested, in simply attacking on television and going on to the next dinner party. How about the fact that he's a frequent guest on networks that think he is a war criminal? The people who are applauding him right now because he says the right things about the president are people who said that he's responsible for millions of dead in Iraq and thousands of dead Americans because of his foreign policy blunders, but he says the right things about the president. He helps guard the elite, so now he's being welcomed in. The best thing you can do with George Will and Bill Crystal is to turn them off. I get to write mean things about them every now and then, but I don't have any guarantee they read it. Maybe I can mail it to them. Uh, I did have a one, this is a really difficult moral ethical quandary, whether or not I should make fun of David Brooks in a column because he lives near me and he's got a pool and there are very few pools in Capitol Hill. <laughs> and it gets very hot on Capitol Hill. But I decided that it was probably likely he wouldn't see it, so I wrote it anyways. Those are the ethical challenges, right? <laughs> These, these, these groups, though, the weakness standard, they, they've made it the business model to run themselves out of business. And there were some good people over there. Matt Labash was phenomenal. Uh, Andy Ferguson was phenomenal. But I do admit that as an organization at the News Foundation and before that at the for-profit Daily Caller, we had a deeply important mantra to never operate in the red after the first 18 months of existence. Always operate in the black. Always, at least, if you're not making a lot of money, don't be losing money. And I have a little bit of scorn for members of the media, Washington Post, the Weekly Standard, rest in peace, who never had to pay attention to that, who just took dad's credit card and went running with it until dad got bored and cut it off. The, I think that the media, that's an example of irresponsibility, using your platform to simply attack your readership, to attack people who support Trump, to call them the, what did, what did Hillary Clinton call? The deplorables. She's a nasty, nasty woman, as President Trump once said. <laughs> that was an interesting debate, too. He had the fervor of an evangelist, someone who, I feel like the likeliness that President Trump has had some kind of nearness to abortion in his life is very high, but I feel like, like a lot of people in the media, he'd never even considered it, never thought deeply about it until he ran for president of the United States. And when he came out in Las Vegas, it's like someone had just told him what abortion was. And it blew him away. You could tell when he attacked Hillary Clinton, when Hillary Clinton said it's Roe v. Roe v. Wade is a woman's right, you're attacking a woman's right. Most Republicans would say, well, it's settled law of the land, my Christian beliefs that lead me to think otherwise. And he went out eyes wide and said, you know what they do? They take the baby and they kill it. She's a nasty, nasty woman. <laughs> like someone had just told him, do you know what abortion is? I'd never seen such a forceful defense of life ever on the national stage, and it came from Manhattanite, Donald Trump. It's been very interesting. And he personally attacked, I think it was Senator Chris Coons, 
I may be messing that up, a Northeast senator, a Democrat, for the party's switch on abortion in a place where there were no cameras. It got leaked to the press. They confronted him at a dinner and said, how could you do this? How could you possibly do this? So it's an interesting champion we have there. We have time for one more question. Is it effective calling fake news fake news? I love it. <laughs> and I shouldn't admit that. The, my favorite thing about the fake news thing that Donald Trump has used and weaponized, right now if you hear President Trump call something fake news, they say that's an assault on the First Amendment, it undermines democracy, it undermines America. The first time you might have heard the term fake news was actually from the media when they were attacking conservative news. After Hillary Clinton lost, there was a serious push to cut off conservative media's legs. They called it fake news. They said it was Russia funded. There was this really strange and surreal press conference under the Obama White House where over and over again, the press secretary had to remind the press that because of the First Amendment, they couldn't crack down on media outlets that the White House disagreed with. The press was begging them to. It was unbelievable, and they were asking, they were requesting the help of Silicon Valley, our overlords at Facebook and Twitter, to decide what was fake and what was real. And it may start with something that's on its face false. One New York reporter pointed out to me as an article that made a difference in fake news that the Pope endorses Donald Trump was going to swing votes. And I had to point out to him that anyone who listens to the Pope wasn't voting for a third-term abortionist. So it was very unlikely that switched a lot of votes. But the fake news thing came from the media, and it was deeply insidious, trying to get places shut down. You know, the, the, just access to the halls of Congress is controlled by a committee of reporters who vote on this. Al Jazeera has been elected to this committee in the past, an outlet for a slave state, unbelievable uh, turn, and they have worked hard to deny places that are center-right access to Congress. Now call that an assault on media. They've asked for censorship from Silicon Valley, they've asked for censorship from government, and while it may start with a fake news story like Pope endorses Donald Trump, by tomorrow it's gonna to be anyone who's skeptical of global warming being caused by man, or anyone who says that there was evidence of voter fraud in Philadelphia, how dare we? Uh, or anyone who questions the video narrative and a bunch of contractors hanging out in Benghazi narrative that would be called fake news and shut down. So for President Trump to turn it around and weaponize it is one of the most deeply just things. I absolutely love it. And it, you know, if you're ever in Washington, D.C., and you go to the Smithsonian and you see the portrait of uh, Salzberger, is that his name? Uh, yeah, owner of the New York Times, the one who turned it around years ago. It, the description says that he took over the failing New York Times because at the time it was failing. And it's one of the best exhibits in the Smithsonian. Donald Trump lives forever in there. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. This has been wonderful.